Well, these two issues are quite different. Endemic diseases are diseases which are with us every day. And for those, we must work to get equitable, more equitable access to medicines and vaccines to treat them and to get rid of them. On the other hand, a pandemic has to be dealt with differently. It requires a collective action. And in addition, it requires the same access to the medicines that might be useful in dealing with it. But the two interact in two different ways. One way is that if there is a pandemic with many, many people sick, then it will crowd other diseases out of hospitals and out of health centers, and that will be very detrimental to those diseases. At the same time, we never know what's in store. A good example is smallpox eradication. Smallpox was killing three million people in 1967. It's now eradicated, and in 1980, the year in which it was era declared eradicated, a new disease began to first appear, and in 1981 it was identified as AIDS. In 1984, a military recruit was vaccinated with smallpox vaccine, and this was an event which caused AIDS in him. Even though it wasn't known he was HIV infected, six months later he was dead of AIDS after that vaccination. So we know today that the interaction of HIV and smallpox vaccine would not permit us to eradicate smallpox as we did before 1980. So the lesson is do the best with the tools that we have today to get rid of the endemic disease burden so that if a new disease appears in pandemic or other form and interferes with our treatment, we won't have that same problem occur. The best way to develop resilience and ability to deal with communicable diseases after a disaster or a major event is to develop beforehand the capacity to detect and respond to these diseases. Countries must develop a capacity to sur do surveillance, to identify where diseases are occurring, and do their best to, to control those diseases. These systems should then play over after a complex emergency or a disaster such as an earthquake or a tsunami. In countries where governments are prepared, those things work very well, as in Japan. Japan was there providing the aid that was necessary, the health aid after the tsunami. However, in Haiti, where there was a government which wasn't prepared for good health care before the earthquake, afterwards it was a very big disaster in itself. Restoring access to health care was done by a multitude of non-governmental organizations who were allowed into the country and who weren't coordinated. So that they were giving care sometimes which was inferior to what care should have been. At other times it was against government policy and at other times government was not involved in coordinating those activities. So the government lost control of what was doing, NGOs were doing as they pleased, and nothing was done to really strengthen the government systems of health care that existed before the earthquake. Had Haiti been more prepared for resilience and had they had a better health system beforehand, it would have been better afterwards. During a pandemic, the populations will respond to the group that they trust the most. If they trust the government, they will do what the government says. If the government has exaggerated, has done things that the people don't believe, or has misled the population in the past, then trust will be less. And the people will look for other sources of information in which they trust. So the goal of governments, of international organizations, and of everyone communicating risk about a pandemic or an epidemic is that they should provide the truth, they should not exaggerate the truth, but they should speak in terms that everyone will understand. If, for example, a stockpile is being developed, this can be explained as an insurance policy, which everyone understands. People have insurance for their houses. They also want to have insurance for their health, and a stockpile of vaccine is that insurance. It has nothing to do with how many cases could occur or might occur. It has to do with the fact that there's uncertainty, and when there's an uncertain situation, insurance is purchased.
It's clear that infectious diseases cross borders without passports and very easily. What's important, though, is that we continue to respect national sovereignty. That national sovereignty is very important. It's been earned by countries and it must be maintained by countries. However, countries must also have a sense of community in a world which is interconnected and, and wired. And so as a result, it's a responsibility of a sovereign nation to participate in global activities without giving up sovereignty. That means reporting when diseases occur. That means helping solve problems which other countries may have as re relates to inability to get vaccine or medicines or a whole series of things that countries must work together to provide. So countries should never give up their sovereignty. What they do need to do is learn how to participate in global events as a global partner. Thank you.